And you might ask, what happened in the 90s? Well, the world became a lot smaller. It shrunk. And I, I might add that the shrinking um, due to uh, communication and exchange of information that allowed communities across the globe to share information readily um, is also one of those byproducts of basic, re basic science translating into technology. Another one, it has been estimated within a decade nearly 80% of the world's middle income consumers would live in nations outside the currently industrialized world. China alone could have 595 million middle income consumers and 82 million upper middle income consumers. The total population of the United States is currently 300 million and it's projected to be 315 million in a decade. Chemical companies closed 70 facilities in the United States in 2004 and tagged 40 more for shutdown. Of 120 chemical plants being built around the world with price tags of $1 billion or more, one is in the United States and 50 are in China. No new refineries have been built in the United States since 1976. A company can hire nine factory workers in Mexico for the cost of one in America. A company can hire eight young professional engineers in India for the cost of one in America. The share of leading edge semiconductor manufacturing capacity owned or partly owned by US companies today is half of what it was recently, as recently as 2001. During 2004, China overtook the United States to become the leading exporter of information technology products, according to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. The United States ranks only 12th among OECD countries in the number of broadband connections per 100 inhabitants. In South Korea, 38% of all undergraduates receive their degrees in natural science or engineering. In France, the figure is 47%, in China, 50%, and Singapore, 67%. In the United States, 15%. Some 34% of doctoral degrees in the natural sciences, including the physical, biological, earth, ocean, and atmospheric sciences, okay, 34% of those doctoral degrees, and 56% of engineering PhDs in the United States are awarded to foreign-born students. Now again, I want to stress here, these are not bad indicators. There are certainly indicators that should cause us to sit up and notice the trends and be able to rise above that to, to find ways to continue maintaining leadership in the areas where we can, kind of like a good, well-run business. You find out what you can do well, and you concentrate on that. Well, what can we do well as the world changes? The committee noted that the nation is, in their opinion, unlikely to receive some sort of sudden wake-up call about this trend. Rather, the problem is likely uh, that it will evidence itself gradually over a surprisingly short period of time. Now, what are the key recommendations of this committee and this report? The key point of the report, uh, in terms of their recommendations, have to do with four things. Increasing the quality of K through 12 math and science education. They call it 10,000 teachers, 10 million minds. And there's lots of grants and scholarships available to help encourage teachers to enter science and math uh, uh, instruction. Research, which they call sowing the seeds, higher education, which they call best and brightest, and economic policy, which they call incentives for innovation. We don't have much time to go into the specifics of these recommendations, but I want to uh, hone in on two in particular, research and education. How do we remain leaders of innovation? One of the key recommendations in the report was to recognize that the U.S is failing if it wants to keep producing and being uh, the producer of the technologies that we've come to um, lead in because other, other countries are producing them faster and cheaper and we've got to be aware of the fact that we are now importing that uh, inter um, technology rather than exporting it. The question was what can we do here in the US? Well, one of the basic recognitions of this report is that we have an excellent higher education system. Students come to the US to go to college and especially to graduate school. This is the one gem of the U.S. that we can continue to cultivate, and that's why they recommend better math and science education in the early years and cultivation of the best and the brightest uh, in the college years. We at Westmont recognize the importance of edu educating young people, but here's our call to action, and especially our call to recognize the global imperative, that we are in a global world that is dynamically changing as a result of its shrinking, that science is largely uh, the, the origin of that shrinking, but that technology, again, this fruit that the public sees, which we uh, associate with our economic prosperity and, and style of life, is something that we stand to lose uh, very, very quickly if we don't recognize these indicators. But the stress that they lay is that the U.S. can continue to lead in innovation. This is a word that Steve Forbes used many times this morning, and I was very thankful for that. And innovation is, in today's world, as scientifically based as it is, the way we're surrounded by technologies, I mean, you can't, 
get out the back door without bumping into various types of technology. If you think about all the, the waves that are in the air, the cell phones and pagers, and I mean, everything that we rely on um, that for that quality of life, which again, is, it's debatable as to whether that's truly beneficial in all instances, and in some it may not be. But uh, the US is called to be the leader in innovation, and that means we've got to continue cultivating excellent educational facilities, ex excellent educational institutions, and concentrate on the, the um, cultivation of curiosity and the imagination in our young people that are going to go out and make that difference. OK, I'm going to close now with a couple of quick uh, remarks uh, to pull this together. Our imperative here is not only to teach excellent science, but to recognize that there is a very pragmatic role in the teaching of excellent science besides what we generally like to talk about, and that is intellectual curiosity and discovery. We need to produce citizens that are going to go out and make a difference in this world uh, in light of this changing world, and therefore an understanding of this global community is absolutely paramount um, to educating our students properly, for them to understand the world into which they're moving. I'm just going to uh, leave you with one last thought, and that is, I would like to go beyond the global and say the universal imperative because it's also true that science is the reason that we have attempted to communicate with the potential other civilizations out there. Um, as you know, in the mid-70s, there was a, as you may know, a large radio dish beamed a message up into space, and you would wonder how can you communicate with, with civilizations that may or may not be there, but you don't know what their language is. Well, it's the language of science. Um, the message was sent out in a repeating pattern of a number of, of bits that happened to be the product of two prime numbers. And, if, and any civilization that's intelligent would recognize that. They would arrange it into a rectangle, and one way it doesn't show, it shows gibberish, the other way it shows a pattern. And the pattern shows a radio dish, it shows a human being. It, it indicates in binary numbers, which any civilization would understand, how big we are using the universal uh, knowledge of the 22 centimeter line of hydrogen, which is emitted in, in nebula. So any, any intelligent civilization would know about the 22 centimeter line, it would know what the wavelength of that is, and then in a binary number it translates that into the size of human beings. So we are on the cutting edge of global imperative. We're actually already trying to make connections with the universe. Thank you. Well, that was fantastic. The I've always wondered what happened to the people who stopped talking. They went to this other civilization. So. <laughs> Jeff Schloss has been so gracious in waiting. He literally is rushing to the airport to go to a speaking engagement. So Jeff, would you please start in case you need to leave quickly? Yeah. Well, thanks, Warren. That was really fascinating. And you know, I, I I think not too immodestly consider myself a product of an intelligent civilization, but I sure didn't follow that very. You know. <laughs> Listen, I, I am a biologist, and I want to reflect very briefly with you on three aspects of our curriculum in biology, but also in the other sciences that I think have a global uh, relevance within the context of uh, the faith tradition that Westmont uh, seeks to honor. So here we go, three, three brief points. First of all, in uh, spite of prominent critics and unfortunately advocates as well, biblical tradition has immense but really balanced regard for the natural world as neither deified nor denigrated. Instead, it's viewed as a work of art. And the Hebrew scriptures say, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament is his handiwork. And specifically relevant to the global imperative focus of our session here, they go on to say this, Day after day utters knowledge. There is no language where their voice is not heard. The natural world is viewed as a cross-cultural, multilingual, dramatically ecumenical communication of the Creator's majesty. And so I'm not sure we need the language of science uh, to, to reveal this. In fact, sometimes if we distort science to make a theological point, we dishonor both the creation and science. But one thing science can do is it can amplify parts of the song of creation that are otherwise out of range of our unaided ears. For example, when we see a new supernova, as we did just a few weeks ago with Westmont's telescope, or when one of our graduates discovers a new species or invents a solution to latex allergies and becomes the world expert in this area, or develops a new widely accepted theory for how salt marshes work, all of which have happened, uh, they contribute to a global conversation 
uh, and a global conversation that I think honors the God that we claim to serve.